Welcome to AISC's live webinar, which is part one of our two-part series, Designing Structural Stainless Steel. Part one will be presented by Katherine Hauska, and part two next week will be presented by Nancy Badu. My name is Patrick Newman, and I'm with the AISC Continuing Education Group, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. So with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Catherine Hauska is with TMR, TMR Stainless. Catherine is a metallur metallurgical engineer and internationally recognized stainless steel architectural and construction consultant. She is an author of over 150 publications and is a frequent speaker. She has over 30 years of experience has consulted on a wide range of stainless steel structural engineering projects and is involved with several active atmospheric corrosion studies. Ms. Hauska was a member of the steering committee for the AISC design guide, Structural Stainless Steel, and is an active member of numerous standard setting bodies. Also attending is Nancy Bedou, Associate Director at the Steel Construction Institute in the United Kingdom and Nancy will be presenting next week the part two of this webinar. And she's attending today, and we may hear from her during the question and answer session. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Catherine. Thank you. So our topics for today will be applications, history, the performance and sustainability of stainless steel, We'll talk about the specific stainless steels and families that are used in the design guide, some of the physical and mechanical properties and how they compare to other metals, available product forms, and then we'll spend quite a bit of time on specification, both for corrosion performance and the appropriate ASTM and AWS standards. Stainless steel is not a new structural material. The ma stainless steel was invented about 100 years ago, and there are certainly earlier stainless steel structural applications, but the first very large one was the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. And it inspired the first structural research prior to its construction. The structural components for this 630-foot-high uh, structure are an exterior welded stainless steel plate triangle out of type 304 stainless steel and an interior welded carbon steel plate triangle. There are stiffener rods between the layers and concrete between the layers for the first 300 feet. The research that was done in advance of construction led to SEI ASCE 8. The Unisphere, uh, which has been featured in quite a few Hollywood films, they seem to like to blow it up or land alien spaceships on it, was actually built a year prior to that using the same research. It highlighted the structural product forms that were available at that time. The first large building framing application for stainless steel was completed in 1995 to the Canadian National Archives. Stainless steel was selected because of the 500-year design life and the requirement that it must withstand earthquakes, tornadoes, and potentially a corrosive environment as, uh, the in as it changed over time. Additionally, it is not possible to use coatings within an archive environment, and many of the structural components are within the uh, building itself because coatings will outgas. There were certainly buildings prior to that with structural framing, including the European and Japanese demonstration buildings, which were constructed to get stainless steel into the design codes there. Um, I should note SEI ASCE 8, which covers cold formed design of structural stainless steel, was adopted in Australia, Japan, and South Africa, and what was used initially in Europe. 
Euro code 3 was the first such code globally to include all product forms for stainless steel, and Nancy, who will be the presenter for part two, is actually its chair. So it covers hot and cold rolled forms, as well as welded structural stainless steel. AISC Design Guide 27, Structural Stainless Steel, was issued in September 2013. It is a free PDF download for AISC members, um, and hard copies are available either for $40 for members or $80 for non-members. It covers fasteners and tension bars, and also the hot rolled and welded structural sections that are 0.125 inches thick or greater. So all of your I-beams, channels, angles, and hollow sections and similar components are covered in the austenitic and duplex stainless steels. You would continue to use SEI AESC 8 for cold formed sections. Not everything in AISC 360, the specification for structural steel buildings, is covered. Design Guide 27 includes most common structural shape and load scenarios. Um, all, and some of the carbon and stainless steel rules are identical. Where there are differences, the standard carbon steel equations are adjusted with multipliers. And that will be covered in part two next week. The primary topics covered in the design guide are stainless steel properties, specification, and selection, design intention, compression, flexure, and shear, various other loading conditions, mechanical and welded connection design, fire resistance, fabrication, and erection. I will be covering chapters 1, 2, and 12 in today's presentation. There are three families of stainless steel covered in the design guide. You should know that there are literally hundreds of stainless steels. And we have focused on the few that are most likely to be used in a structural application. Starting first with the austenitic stainless steels, and austenitic does refer to the grain structure of the stainless. These are 300 series numbers with 304, 304L, 316, and 316L covered in the design guide. When you see an L after the number, that refers to low carbon levels. And that's required for welding. It is not necessary for uh, any other type of forming, but it is important for the uh, corrosion resistance and structural integrity of welds as you go to heavier sections. The austenitics are strengthened by cold work. They're easy to weld, and you can make, make tighter bends with them than you can with the other stainless steel families that I will discuss. They are also not magnetic. The duplex stainless steels, which are also used for larger structural sections as well as fasteners, have a microstructure that combines austenitic and ferritic uh, structures. The ferritic structure is what you would see in carbon steel and in some other stainless steels. The specific stainless steels that are covered in the guide are UNS 32101, uh, which is also referred to as LDX 2101, 2304, and 2205. These are higher in strength, and they are magnetic. They are supposed to be uh, the ferritic microstructure makes that uh, a characteristic of this material. The precipitation hardened stainless steels are only available for tension bars and fastener, with 17.4 pH being representative of this family. They are the highest strength stainless steels that we will be discussing. But they are also the least corrosion resistant, and they are magnetic. So the corrosion resistance uh, limits them in terms of possible applications. This slide compares minimum design strengths, starting at the top with uh, 
some of the aluminums that are commonly used in structural design. Um, next, I have the austenitic stainless steels, and that is minimum strength without additional cold work, and that's for heavier plates. Then I show um, A36 and grade 50 carbon steel, and the next step down is the duplex stainless steels. Those that, and at the very bottom, I show 17.4 pH. There are a range of strengths available for it. As I mentioned, it is only available in tension bars and fasteners. And um, it does provide much higher strength. The stress strain characteristics will be discussed in more detail in the second presentation. But I did want to show you uh, how the curves look relative to what you're used to with carbon steel. Unlike carbon steel, we do not have a defined yield point, so the yield strength is determined by 0.2% offset. And as you can see, uh, the duplex stainless steels are stronger, as I illustrated in the previous slide. The, there are a number of very common stainless steel structural section applications. The first, food, beverage, and pharmaceutical industry applications. Our stainless steel is selected because it is very corrosion resistant. And some of these are, are quite corrosive because of the use of salt or other um, additives to the food or beverages. Additionally, uh, coatings are potential contaminants. So the ability to use a corrosion-resistant stainless steel without coatings make them an ideal choice. There are also many highly corrosive industrial environments where the higher alloyed stainless steels are the only options that will withstand the environment unless you do a great deal of, of coating and recoating on a regular basis. In water treatment and processing, there are also some very corrosive pro steps in the process um, where there are high levels of chlorides used, and uh, it is used for those as well. Where there is high exposure to coastal or de-icing salt, including spray, splashing, or immersion in salt water, Stainless steel is preferred. It is also used for cryogenic applications. Uh, Nancy will speak a bit about those, as well as um, some of the seismic um, blast. And I'll talk a bit about high impact benefits. For aesthetic applications, like memorials and monuments and highly visible architectural components, it is growing in popularity. Probably uh, over 90% of the market is for industrial applications of various types. And here I'm illustrating a few, a, an elevated walkway, and um, gates for a, um, a water treatment facility. New Poly Plaza in Beijing is an example of how stainless steel is being used for low-profile glass curtain wall systems. This arbor in Brisbane, Australia is coastal. Um, it would not be possible to maintain a coating once the plants are in place, and you would not want to use a coating that might be toxic to plants, making a 316 an obvious choice. The US Air Force Memorial and, and many other memorials um, around the world are built with stainless steel. In this case, uh, the design was created by Paycock Freed with Eric doing the structural engineering. The spires are up to 284 feet in height. The primary structural materials are type 316L plates, 3 quarters of an inch thick that was welded together. There are 316L rebar spaceners or stiffeners within. And there's concrete in the lower half. 
the San Diego Harbor Drive Bridge is an example of some of the pedestrian bridges that have been constructed around the world using stainless steel. The trend has been toward the duplexes because of their high strength. There also have been vehicular and rail bridges constructed from stainless steel as well. Stainless steel is a good choice for sustainable um, applications where you have to design for long life. As you're probably aware, U.S. Green Building Council's lead changed last year and now requires a 60-year minimum design life. So in a more aggressive application, that might make stainless steel an obvious choice. Um, there's increased emphasis on avoiding repair, replacement, and, um, and in some cases, in a more fragile environments, sometimes protective coating. It's important with sustainable construction to use high recycled content or recapture rate, to reuse components, reduce material requirements, and if you can, extend the life of other materials, and stainless steel contributes to all of these. An important part of this decision process is to conduct a life cycle cost analysis. And um, I'm sure there will be some questions about what stainless steel's premium is over carbon steel, so I've provided some basic guidelines. Generally, from the standpoint of the raw material, prior to any um, fabrication into a finished uh, assembly, the rolled shapes, like angles and channels, are typically four to five times the cost of carbon steel, and that would be for 316L. Um, the duplex welded structural sections are generally about six times the cost of carbon steel, and um, type 316L welded structural sections are about eight times. Now, that does not take into account that there is no requirement for galvanizing, painting, and for some applications, as Nancy will explain, you might not need fireproofing. There's also no maintenance requirements for coating reapplication, which can be an issue in, in more aggressive applications. Um, and it does not consider the possibility that you might be able to reduce section sizes with duplex stainless steel. The fabrication and erection costs should be equivalent. So I mentioned that stainless steel is about 100 years old. There have been earlier structural applications in the gateway arch, and the rebar used in one of these piers is such an example. It was completed in 1941. So the functional pier with the bridge, with the uh, ship at the end, has had numerous uh, amounts of testing done on it. There are a lot of NACE papers, if you are interested. The core samples confirm the performance of the stainless steel. The non-functional pier looked like this after 30 years. So this is an example of long life. Well, the initial cost for the rebar is quite a bit higher than for carbon steel. The actual installed cost is generally only between 2 and 12 percent higher if you take into account the cost of repair or replacement, and possibly not being able to use um, a, a peer, then the real cost difference um, over time favors stainless steel. Here are two railing examples. In New York City, I have been told that in splash zones, the carbon steel that is painted and often repainted every year will often fail structurally within eight to 10 years. That's part of why 316 TI stainless steel was used for Hudson River Park railings, which you can see in this picture. Um, and this is the current picture, and they, they've been in place for quite some time, um, and there's no maintenance requirement. The Canary Islands also have parks. Um, these, this is a picture of 2205 railings that have been in place for 30 years. They had previously used carbon steel railings, 
that were painted annually and failed structurally after eight years. They had looked at 316 for this application, and the mock-up started showing some staining after a few months. Um, it wasn't something that would have affected structural integrity, but it wasn't attractive, so 2205 was used instead, and there hasn't been a corrosion problem. Pulp plants are a very aggressive industrial environment, and this is a structural framing for one out of 2205 duplex stainless steel, um, a Painted carbon steel would need a great deal of maintenance and still might not survive for the intended life of the plant. Recycling and recapture rates are two terms that you might have heard in terms of sustainability. Uh, LEED tends to focus on recycled content, and that's the percentage of scrap that's used in material production. The recapture rate is the percentage of material that is recaptured at the end of service life and then reused without loss of its initial characteristics. So it is recaptured and then recycled into exactly the same material without any downcycling or, or loss of its inherent characteristics. That recapture rate is a much better measure of natural resource retention than the percentage of recycled material that is used. You should be aware that metal uh, has been refined uh, since about 6,000 BC. And during that time, it has been recaptured at the end of life and reused very consistently. So metal producers have a very long history of recycling stainless steel it provides a great deal of benefit, including reduced costs in manufacturing, not just the obvious sustainability benefits. This chart shows you how stainless steel compares in terms of recycled content and recapture rate to other uh, metals you might use. On average, globally, the recycled content of stainless steel is about 70%. Some stainless steel producers report up to 90% recycled content. The recapture rate for the structure for stainless steel used in building and construction applications, including infrastructure, is 92%. It's also 92% for industrial equipment and several other common applications. For stainless steel specification, it is important to determine the level of corrosion resistance first, um, and then determine the appropriate stainless steel at that level of corrosion resistance based on your desired properties. You would list the ASTM specification or specifications, and then the specific alloy that's required by UNS number and then you can also list the common name, with 304 being a common name and UNS S30400 being its UNS number. On a fundamental level, stainless steel is iron plus at least 10.5% chromium, and it is also low carbon. I should point out that the name is stainless, not stain free. So if you pick the wrong stainless steel for an environment, you could have corrosion staining on the surface. The alloying elements that play the largest role in corrosion resistance are chromium, molybdenum, and nitrogen. Nickel can affect corrosion resistance in some applications, but its primary benefit is formability and weldability. So when carbon steel corrodes, you get gross corrosion of the whole surface with significant thickness loss. In comparison, stainless steel forms a thin passive film on the surface because of its chromium content, and that protects it from corrosion. And when stainless steel corrodes, you get small pits on the surface that tend to be very round in shape as opposed to typical carbon steel corrosion. So it looks quite different. And, and this sample 
of stainless steel was cleaned so you could see after the staining was removed um, what pitting looks like. As I mentioned, the primary alloying elements that affect corrosion resistance are the chromium, molybdenum, and nitrogen. I'm also showing nickel because of its effect on formability and weldability. There may be other alloying elements um, in some of these stainless steels, but the primary focus in terms of talking about corrosion resistance are the chromium, molybdenum, and nitrogen. You can calculate a pitting resistance equivalent number, which can be used as a guide to determine the relative corrosion resistance of stainless steels using this equation. So the last column shows that number with the lowest numbers being the least corrosion resistant. With, so I'm showing 17,4 pH at the top, at 15 as the least corrosion resistant, then 304, 304L as a step up. Um, around 25, we have 2304, 316, and LDX 2101, which um, are essentially equivalent in corrosion resistance. The next step up is duplex 2205 at 35. And while it's not included specifically in the design guide, I'm showing 2507 as, again, a, another step up in corrosion resistance. I should note that even if some of these other du higher corrosion resistant duplexes and austenics aren't shown in the guide, the guidance is relevant to them as well. There has been a great deal of corrosion research done around the world comparing performance of different metals. This is a picture of some samples from a Curie Beach uh, site that's on the Carolina coast. Low pollution, moderate level of sea salt exposure. And these samples were all 800 feet from the mean high tide. If you compare 304 and 316, the 316 doesn't have any staining on the surface. The 304 has some light pitting. That pitting would not structurally affect its performance. But in an aesthetic application, it might not be acceptable. In comparison, you can see what used to be aluminized carbon steel. That data from different test sites can be used to predict performance. There are several things that you need to look at when you are comparing uh, different uh, materials. The first is to look at um, you know, the, the environment itself. And you can see how corrosion rates vary in different sites in the South African exposure data. If we look at the severe marine environment, which is uh, something that's say a couple hundred yards inland from the water with moderate levels of corrosion. You could see that there's very little difference between 304 and 316. That could be the difference between 304 having staining on the surface that's not acceptable and 316 being OK. But as we go to um, other materials, such as aluminum, you can see a much higher corrosion rate. Typically, aluminum has anywhere from 10 to 100 times the corrosion rate of stainless steel in a, an environment with salt or higher levels of pollution. Uh, copper also has higher corrosion rates under those conditions. And in here, we can see core 10 as representative of weathering steel and then mild steel. There is a. Uh, Significant difference if you compare that to, let's say, a rural environment. So data of this type can be quite helpful in terms of predicting performance in these more aggressive locations. So we first want to look at pollution levels. Is there acid rain? Is there, are there particular accumulations? Is there salt present of any type, either coastal or de-icing? Weather conditions can play a significant role particularly if you have quite a bit of rain washing and it's a boldly exposed application. 
Will there be any maintenance cleaning? Um, and then there are design issues that directly affect performance, such as uh, the type of finish that you specify, a rougher finish, will accumulate more of what's corrosive in the environment and will retain moisture longer, which accelerates corrosion. And if you've created crevices between materials, you could also have a crevice corrosion problem. I did want to point out, this is an acid rain map for the United States. Um, if you had looked at the same map um, perhaps 10 years ago, pretty anywhere east of the Mississippi would have been in a shade of yellow or orange. And we've essentially um, eliminated that problem now, although um, the West Coast, which used to be entirely pH neutral, is now starting to show the effects of being downwind of China. Um, if you were to look at acid rain maps for other parts of the world, such as China, you would see extremely acidic rain, and that would have to be factored into your selection process. And, and this shows you why. Uh, this is World Health Organization data showing pollution levels for different parts of the world. In the United States, uh, our, our major cities are pretty much all in the moderate range. Um, so are most European cities. Um, and um, as opposed to um, the developing uh, and, and uh, you know, parts of the world, where you have very high levels of pollution, which make the environment much more aggressive. One big factor in material selection is exposure to salt. This is true for all materials. Above certain combinations of temperature and humidity levels, the certain salts, which are hygroscopic, start to pull moisture out of the air and create highly corrosive salt slurries on surfaces. All of these salts are present in sea salts, although sodium fluoride is the primary constituent in sea salt. We used to just use sodium chloride for de-icing, but increasingly calcium chloride and occasionally magnesium chloride are used for that purpose. When we only used sodium chloride for de-icing, you had to reach 50 degrees and 76% humidity for it to start to form this corrosive salt slurry um, without the presence of moisture, such as rain or fog. With the increased use of calcium chloride, it becomes corrosive as soon as you were at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 45% humidity. So that is making uh, many locations far more corrosive than they used to be. This uh, map from the National Atmospheric Deposition Program shows where, um, how far salt is going inland and in what quantity. Any place that is in orange, um, the salt levels are 10 kilograms per hectare in terms of annual deposition. The data does vary tremendously from year to year. And I did want to point out that this was a rather unusual year for the northeastern U.S. Typically, the end of Long Island has the highest salt deposition rates of any place in the country, and it did not this year. Um, salt travels quite far inland in very high concentrations in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the entire state of Florida is almost always um, uh, exposed to pretty high levels of salt, and that's generally true of the Gulf Coast region as well. You can get similar maps for many parts of the world. They're certainly available in Europe, Australia, and, uh, and other locations. There is a corrosion map for the U.S. and Canada, but it was done back in the 1980s by the automobile industry. Um, you can see exactly where the snow belt is and where de-icing salt was used at that time. I did want to point out uh, that this map, which shows de-icing salt use, um, 
this is where we were with the icing salt use in the ni in 1980, and this is where we are today. So we've essentially doubled our de-icing salt use, and we use it in far more places. So the area affected uh, is much larger in terms of de-icing salt. You can also see the coastal effect. I would ignore the map for the west coast. They didn't have much data there. And as I showed you in the previous map, uh, this area in the Pacific uh, Northwest is quite aggressive. The most corrosive place in North America uh, shown in this map is Nova Scotia uh, in red. And that's very corrosive because they have almost daily high salt content fog and light rain which is almost exactly the same conditions you have right here. Um, so that can make uh, the location much worse. Uh, there have been thousands of studies done on de-icing salt-related corrosion around the world, but most are related to either bridge deck failures or um, the effect on plant life. This study done by the Illinois DOT National Atmospheric Deposition Program and Argonne National Lab was the first to really look at how far the icing salt travels from roadways. The splash zone is 49 feet. And it showed that the icing salt particles can travel up to 1.2 miles downwind from roadways. And I am aware of the icing salt related corrosion being documented as high as the 59th floor of a building in downtown Chicago. It does stay in the air for days after a snow or ice event. In terms of aesthetic specification, if you don't want visible corrosion, then the 17.4 pH, which I mentioned is used for tension bars and fasteners, should be restricted to either interior applications or those protected from the environment. 304 should either be used for interiors or for low corrosion environments like rural suburban uh, areas with low to moderate pollution levels. I don't mention salt because um, it could certainly show corrosion staining. 316 can withstand more aggressive applications with somewhat higher pollution and low to moderate levels of de-icing salt. The uh, arches in, in the Galleria area in Houston, which are structural, um, welded together uh, plate, are 316L. And another early structural application for stainless. Uh, to show you what that means, um, I've included samples here from uh, three locations in Pittsburgh, where I live, on the equivalent of the second floor. I'm showing um, 430, which is equivalent in corrosion resistance to 17.4 pH as a point of comparison. Uh, the, this uh, piece has um, some very deep pitting. And, and these samples were, by the way, in place for three years without cleaning. So here we have fairly deep pitting. Here we have superficial, very light pitting with 304. That staining would be removed with a light cleaning. And, you, and the pits are so small, you wouldn't see them. With 316, we have some bird droppings and dirt, but no significant staining. So this would be applicable for aesthetic applications. Now, if you were only interested in structural integrity, your choices might be different. Examples of more corrosive locations include areas with spray, splashing, or immersion in salt water. These railings are being splashed with salt water. They're around Hong Kong Convention Center. And they look like that after three years. They're type 316. If you have, so high salt exposure of any type um, should lead you to a higher alloy stainless steel. Moderate to high industrial pollution or a more, more aggressive industrial environment where there'll be no cleaning is another application. Or will there be very high levels of particulate, whether it's dust or industrial uh, particulate, creates crevices and also makes the location more aggressive. Uh, examples 
of more corrosion-resistant stainless steels include 2205, which I showed you was a, a, a nice step up from 316, and 2507, which is even more corrosion-resistant. One example of 2205 use is the uh, new FDR Memorial in New York. Um, I consulted on this project. They originally had planned to use 316, but then they uh, told me they were planning for a 100-year storm surge event, in which case uh, the island could be submerged in salt water possibly for days. For that reason, 2205 was selected for very, the railings throughout the, the park. Uh, it was submerged, and they did have to remove debris, but there was no corrosion staining afterwards. One of the most aggressive locations in the world is uh, our coastal areas in the Middle East, and where 316 has uh, started to show staining in as little as sometimes weeks uh, or, or within a, a few months. So uh, research has been done uh, by Utacumpo. It has not been published, but they did give me permission to share this. I took the corrosion rate data that they had determined um, and then uh, compared it to, to the Smackno Architectural Sheet Metal Manual's guidance for uh, standing seam roofing, and that's what these thicknesses are, and calculated the time to perforation. You could do the same thing uh, with any component uh, using corrosion data if it's available. Um, I'm not, I didn't include all the metals that were included, but 2205 duplex had no corrosion on the surface, so we know that it will last 50 or more years without a problem. Um, the galvanized steel corrosion rate was slowed down a bit by the uh, zinc on the surface, um, but we're calculating uh, 2.2 years to perforation. The aluminum also had a relatively high corrosion rate, as did zinc and copper. Um, the zinc essentially vaporized on the surface. It corroded so quickly. This is a project uh, which used that data. It's the King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture. The curving shapes that you see are actually sunscreens, and they are made out of tubular sections. This gives you a close-up. As you can see, it would have been impossible to maintain a paint coating on this over time, and uh, 2205 was the logical solution uh, for long-term durability. Um, its high strength also um, could have made it section size reduction possible. There's a great deal of data available for soil environments. Um, aluminum and carbon steel really are not suitable for soil. They grow very quickly. Cast iron can provide reasonable life if there are low or no chlorides or salts in the soil. The stainless steels are, have consistently had the best performance in these environments. And the guidance varies with the concentrate, the type of soil environment you have, uh, as you can see in this chart. Um, and quite a bit more data is available for different parts of the world. There's also a great deal of data on sea and brackish water, uh, with this being representative of, of some of that. Um, the 2507 that I showed previously is considered a seawater grade stainless steel. 316 is not. It corrodes very quickly when immersed in salt water. 2205 can provide longer service, but generally not for an application um, that requires more than perhaps 20 years of service. So there are uh, stainless steels, both austenitic and duplex, uh, that are options for quite severe environments. Stainless steel swimming pools, uh, excuse, swimming pool environments can be, again, another very aggressive environment. Um, for normal pools, we have 1 to 3 ppm of uh, 
chloride added to the water for high temperature pools and spas, three to five. We, with that, we end up with a lot of chloramines that rise to the top parts of the pool, particularly if there's inadequate air replacement. We have high temperatures, and in combination with these considerations, it gets quite aggressive. Additionally, if there uh, is excessive use of calcium chloride without water dilution, uh, we can end up with very high salt levels as well. Um, or if there's frequent shocking, which again raises the chloride levels, we can have a much more aggressive environment. Um, sometimes bromine is also added. Um, that, again, increases aggressiveness of the pool environment. Within the pool itself, the deck and railings, 316 is generally the best choice. That's not what should be used in sealing um, or other elevated, low-bearing applications that will not be cleaned. Um, here I have an example of a bolt that broke um, that was 316. This is a ceiling that uh, was inspected by TMR. It was 304 load bearing in a high snow load part of the United States. Uh, when we did core samples, cracks went a third of the way through that deck. That's chloride stress corrosion cracking. Um, absolutely do not use the common stainless steels like 304, 316, etc. cetera. Um, the absolute best choice for a load-bearing application are the six Molly austenitic stainless steels or perhaps the super duplexes like 2507. If you know there will be good maintenance and adequate air replacement, then you might be able to use uh, 2205 and other stainless steels at that level, but um, that should only be done if you're absolutely certain about the, the quality of the environment. If the wrong stainless steel is used, um, it can be difficult to spot chloride stress corrosion cracking unless you have someone that's truly an expert in it, and you should have inspections done regularly if you can't replace it. There's a great deal of guidance available for different industrial environments. It's important to thoroughly categorize that environment in terms of temperature, pH, chemical or acid exposure, particulate and other uh, characteristics. There is a great deal of literature available, uh, both from NACE, uh, which is the uh, International Organization of Corrosion Engineers, as well as producers and industry associations. Um, please obtain the advice of a, stain of a stainless steel corrosion expert um, which could be at one of the producers, an industry association, or an independent expert uh, for these types of applications. Galvanic corrosion is something that should be considered for uh, any structural application where you are combining two metals. Wherever you have dissimilar metals, which are in direct contact, and moisture will be present on a regular basis to join them, even if it's simply condensation, you have to separate them. Otherwise, you will have accelerated corrosion of one, of those, one or more of those metals. Um, that problem can be prevented by separating them, whether with inert washers, paint, or any other non-conducting barrier. This picture shows stainless steel structural sections that are supporting a private resonance in the Gulf Coast of Florida. Um, they chose to use galvanized fasteners, and those fasteners are corroding at a highly accelerated rate and um, are key structural components. This shows the galvanic series of metals and alloys in seawater. Those at the top are anodic, or most likely to corrode, if they are combined with anything below them in the series. So here we have uh, the aluminum alloys, um, which you know some of the uh, aluminized coatings are used on mild steel to protect it, which you can see since mild steel is next below it. Um, and here we have alloy steel. Um, 
here is stainless steel in, 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 in comparison. The stainless steel is cathodic and therefore the least likely to corrode. Um, you can use stainless steel for a small surface area, as we're showing here with these fasteners, um, without having any accelerated corrosion of the carbon steel. Uh, surface area ratio is quite important. Well, in this instance, where we have type 316 curtain wall panels and galvanized fasteners, those fasteners are going to corrode just as rapidly as the bolt in the previous picture I showed you at a highly accelerated rate and will be the point of failure. So the relative ratio of the two metals, and it's dependent on surface area ratio, is extremely important as well. So um, a quick example, uh, the Statue of Liberty, which had to be completely restored in 1986. And by restoration, that meant they had to completely dissemble it and reassemble it. The original cast iron frame had been separated by the copper, from the copper using wool felt, which rotted away over time. Uh, they put many layers of paint on it, trying to prevent corrosion. But as it expanded, um, it pushed outward, damaging copper, and the structural integrity of the whole structure was at risk. Um, the new framing is a duplex stainless steel, so, um, which is shown in this picture. So we know we have a good combination galvanically, uh, large surface area of copper, smaller surface area of the structural uh, duplex stainless steel, and we will not have um, a galvanic corrosion problem in the future. Another example, uh, St. Mary's Cathedral in Tokyo. Um, I had the opportunity to visit this about 10 years ago, which is when I took this picture. The stainless steel was a bit dirty at the time, but otherwise looked fine. It had not been cleaned at all. So I was quite surprised to learn two years later that they were replacing that roof. Um, it turned out that all of this was held in place with carbon steel framing, which corroded away because uh, direct contact, there is condensation under roofs, and um, the whole roof started to peel off. Crevice corrosion has to be considered for any metal that you might use. And, uh, and uh, it's important to note that crevice corrosion can occur at lower temperatures than pitting corrosion. So the orange bars are for uh, the crevice corrosion, the temperature at which it can occur, and um, the blue bars show the critical pitting temperature corrosion. Uh, Level. Now, this is at fairly high concentration. Uh, there are tables that you can obtain that show temperature and salt combinations for different materials. But uh, if you are going to use mechanical fasteners in a, higher, in a, a high salt exposure level and you're not going to seal those crevices, then uh, you should pick a stainless steel that can withstand the crevice corrosion um, temperature that will occur. Uh, as I mentioned, um, all of the uh, all metals have crevice corrosion issues. With stainless steel, it is only a concern if salt is present. With other metals, it can be with uh, pollution and salt. So here are some sites for uh, crevice corrosion. Um, if you create a, a very narrow cavity where salt and moisture can enter, um, but air cannot freely circulate, then you have a location for crevice corrosion. Simply sealing those crevices by welding uh, or sealant, some other method, uh, will el eliminate that problem. So this uh, fastener is a classic case. Uh, this is a, these are structural type 316 sections holding up a pavilion at a beach. 
there's no corrosion on the structural sections or on the, the fasteners. The corrosion is entirely under the washer because we've created a tight crevice and uh, corrosion is occurring there. If you use cables, then there are crevices throughout them. So you notice a much higher level of corrosion on the cable relative to the uh, plain uh, wire here in this uh, woven mesh. There are stainless steels, as I showed in the previous slide, which have much higher levels of crevice corrosion. So as you get to higher concentrations, uh, that's another reason to potentially use um, 2205 relative to, let's say, a 316 in a more severe environment. Finish is quite important. Um, as you have a rougher finish on any material, it will accumulate more salt, um, pollutants, uh, whatever is corrosive in the environment, no matter what material you might have. It will also retain moisture much longer if you have a rougher finish. So with stainless steel specifically, uh, once you get above RA 0.5 microns or 20 micro inches, we see a very rapid increase in corrosion rate. So if a location will not be uh, cleaned, um, then I, we suggest that you stay within this, this region um, below RA 20 micro inches to uh, prevent accelerated corrosion. This is an example of what I mean. It is a bollard in Dusseldorf, Germany, exposed to quite a bit of de-icing salt. All of this came from the same piece of pipe. The top has a smoother um, number four finish, and the bottom has a rougher ground finish. This is purely a matter of surface finish, not the type of stainless steel that was selected um, and causing this problem. And I should point out that staining was not, uh, was not uh, going to affect structural integrity. Any um, shelter location will accumulate more salt and higher levels of pollution, making it more aggressive than uh, locations that are boldly exposed to rain. So uh, this was a, there were a series of tests done in Japan. Other testing has been done in other parts of the world. Here is a sample placed on top of a roof, which will be rain washed. And then samples were placed at increasingly sheltered angles under the eaves of the roof. Um, this is the chloride accumulation after one year. The roof had very little relative to the most sheltered application. Um, again, this is not dependent on stainless steel. This would be true of any material. So uh, sheltered locations are inherently more corrosive. Catherine, can I interrupt for a sec? We have a couple questions, if we could go over them. Sure. Uh, the first one is, what is the maximum content of chlorine in potable water compatible with the use of 304 stainless steel and 316 from a corrosion standpoint? Um, potable water has uh, low chlorine levels. 304 is the standard material for it. Um, in water processing uh, plants, there some parts of the operation can have very high chlorine levels, uh, including especially the building where the chlorination is added to the water, and that's where you might need to use a higher alloy stainless steel. Okay, thank you. And then one other question is, in one of the examples you mentioned 316 TI, what does the TI stand for, and how is that different from 316 L? Uh, TI stands for titanium. It's a so it's a titanium addition to 316. It's an alloy that's more commonly used in Europe, not readily available here. And uh, those were uh, um, primarily castings. Um, it adds a little bit of corrosion resistance, but not very much. It primarily adds strength. 
So it's another means of strengthening. It's not used that much because nitrogen is a much cheaper way to strengthen stainless steels. And okay. I simply identified it because it was the material used for that particular project. Right, sure. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm sure we'll have more questions when we keep going, so I'll let you continue. Sure. Um, every product form that you use in carbon steel is available stainless, um, including extrusions, and um, I'll, you know, generally up to a 12-inch diameter for extrusions, but all of the hot or cold rolled shapes, welded shapes, are available, as well as uh, you know mechanical tubing. Um, generally, you would use welded, although seamless is also available in mechanical tubing. Castings, fasteners are all readily available. Um, I should note that the stock sizes available in stainless steel are more limited than the carbon steel because it's simply not used as readily. Um, generally, those sizes that are most commonly used in industrial applications are what we tend to find in, in inventory, and it's generally only 304, 304L, 316, and 316L that are stocked. But custom fabrications and short runs are readily available. There are companies set up to do exactly that. Uh, you can find sources in the directory on the SSINA website, and that's the Specialty Steel Industry of North America. Um, many service centers for stainless steel stock basic angles and channels, um, and the stainless steel producers can also direct you towards sources. There are some basic terminology uh, factors that must be considered as well. The stainless steel industry uses the word grade to mean chemical composition. Well, uh, structural engineers use it to uh, talk about strength level. So that can sometimes be a point of confusion if you're speaking to someone in the stainless industry. Um, please make sure that uh, you're explaining to them that you're generally talking about the yield strength. Stainless steel gauges are not defined by any standard. Uh, so please specify the, the thickness, whether it's a minimum, maximum, or range that is desired. Um, the, the gauge numbers that are used for stainless steel also mean different thicknesses than what they do for carbon steel. So that's another potential point of confusion. So a um, 14 gauge stainless is not equivalent to the same thickness as it would be for a 14 gauge carbon steel. Always specify first based on corrosion resistance, then the mechanical and physical properties required. Um, additionally, the stainless steel specifications currently list the minimum strength. Those strengths are representative of very heavy plates, not lighter sections. So it might well be possible for a stainless producer to certify uh, without a problem uh, something that might be 10 or 15 points higher in yield strength than um, what the minimums are that are shown in the ASTM standards. Um, you can always tighten standards in ASTM. You just can't loosen them. Um, the one exception. Um, related to increasing strength would be concrete reinforcing bar. The primary specifications you would use within ASTM for plate, sheet, and strip are A240 for your chemistry and mechanical properties, and A480, which covers finishes and dimensional tolerances, including flatness. Um, for uh, SEI ASCE 8, you might use a 666, which is cold rolled uh, stainless steel to produce higher strength levels. If you see a standard that still contains ASTM A167, please replace that with A240. 
that has not been the correct specification for at least 25 years. All of those stainless steels were moved over to 240 a long time ago. For bar and structural shapes, um, the primary specification that you would use for bar, uh, hot rolled, or extruded shapes is ASTM A276. That covers chemistry and mechanical properties. Um, if you have structural sections with filler metal, that are welded with filler metal, then you would use A240 and call out AWS D1.6. Um, if you have laser welded structural sections, then you would use ASTM A1069. Um, A484 is used for the dimensional tolerances and finishes for any of these options. Tube is what you should specify in most instances, not pipe. Uh, structural or mechanical tubing um, is generally welded, not seamless, although you can get both. The dimensions are based on the outside diameter, and it is a standard structural product. You can get either light or heavy wall, and for austenitics, the standard specification you would use for diameters up to 16 inches is A554, which does cover light or heavy wall. Uh, there is a ballot item going through ASTM right now that would add duplexes to 554. Um, in the short term, however, you would have to use A789 instead. If you need a very large outside diameter austenitic tube, then please use A269. Uh, if you specify pipe, then you are paying for a pressure rated material. Um, it has to undergo a lot more testing, so you're paying an unnecessary price premium if it is purely a structural application. And, and pipe is measured based on the inside diameter, not the outside diameter. And as I mentioned, uh, you can get heavy-walled tubular products. Um, for austenitics, you would use A312 if you really need pipe, and 790 for duplexes. There are specifications for castings, quite a few actually, but the most common that would be used would be for austenitics, A351, and for duplexes, A890. The most common fastener standards are the F standards, and um, I've listed them here, F593 uh, for bolts, hex hub screws, and studs, and for metric we have uh, F738. Um, if you have a specialized application, such as a cryogenic application or a high temperature application, or you simply need much higher strength, then you want to use an A standard. Um, A193 is used for high temperature or high pressure service and other special purpose applications. Um, the F standards do not go above one and a half inches. So if you need a large diameter, you would also need to use the A standard. There is a brand new standard that just came out last year, A1082, which covers high strength precipitation hardened and duplex bolting all sizes. So if you truly need high strength for a demanding application, that would generally be the uh, standard you would use. I did want to point out that there are differences in thermal expansion and conductivity from one stainless steel family to another. So here we have the austenitic stainless steels, 304 and 316, relative to the duplex stainless steels. You will see that the austenitic coefficient of thermal expansion is essentially the same as for copper, while the duplexes are quite close to carbon steel. Um, the image shows uh, 
type 316 wall panels that were installed in the wintertime on a courthouse in the UK. No room was allowed for thermal expansion. They were flat when they were installed. Um, they ended up being permanently oil canned. One significant difference between stainless steel and carbon steel is uh, its impact resistance or impact toughness. Um, the gray is the austenitic stainless steels, and those are what are used for cryogenic applications. As you can see, they maintain excellent impact toughness down to extremely low temperatures. Uh, the duplexes are okay for lower temperatures and um, and quite good as you get up to uh, normal ambient temperatures. Um, the carbon steels are would be somewhat closer to or a bit below the ferritic line that I'm showing. So stainless steel provides much better uh, impact or toughness at all temperature levels, and then you have to choose what's most appropriate. Um, and I'm showing um, stainless rail cars, um, bollards, and uh, security gates as applications where you might be able to take advantage of that improved toughness at ambient temperatures. Um, I want to show you an application, uh, a, a video that shows what that actually means. This is work that was done in France for uh, walls that were designed to withstand avalanches. A 700 kilogram ball was dropped on each, and this is uh, first carbon steel reinforced concrete. So you can see uh, certainly the concrete is crumbling. You would absolutely expect that in this type of an impact situation. But the uh, carbon steel bar is also breaking. In comparison, um, we're showing the same test, but done with stainless steel reinforced concrete. As you can see, um, the concrete would crumble uh, where the ball impacts, but the stainless steel do not break, and um, taking advantage of the improved impact toughness of the stainless steel. Welding is a, is a common fabrication method, and it's very important to note that the correct structural welding code for stainless steel is D1.6 not 1.1, which is what you would be familiar with most likely for carbon steel. Um, if you call out 1.1, you could have a number of problems. Uh, 1.6 covers all welding methods for a stainless steel, all stainless steels, and welding different stainless steels to each other. It also covers welding of stainless steel to carbon and alloy steels. One very big difference between stainless steel and carbon steel is that you absolutely do not preheat austenitics or duplex stainless steels, or you could destroy their corrosion resistance. The only stainless steel that sometimes requires preheating are the precipitation hardened grades, and um, that's done very carefully. There are some differences from one family of stainless steel to another. Uh, by far the easiest to weld are the austenitic stainless steels. Um, since we are talking about welding at thicknesses of 0.125 inches and greater, um, I am only showing the L, or low carbon grades. Um, they are the most forgiving. You can often cut out 
a problematic weld and reweld it without an issue. Um, but the austenitics have more movement during welding than the duplexes. Um, the duplexes are a bit more challenging in that you have to be more careful about the heat input. Um, but that varies a bit with um, the, the specific alloy that you're, you're uh, using. Um, the Martin Citix and pH uh, alloys present some special challenges. And as you get to higher alloys, uh, stainless steels in all families, again, it's a bit more challenging. Um, it co the D1.6 also covers uh, design of welded connections, all of the general requirements um, that you might need. Uh, all of the common welding methods for stainless steel can, you know, you know, are uh, all the common welding methods for carbon steel can be used for stainless steel. I should also point out that 1.6 also covers stud welding. Um, the one big difference is that you would not use oxyacetylene welding with stainless steel. D1.6 covers all of the common filler metals that would be used. But there are separate AWS specifications that become more specific about the consumables. You use a matching filler metal for the specific alloy. It's generally slightly more highly alloyed, uh, so that as you lose alloy content during welding, you retain corrosion resistance. Um, the lower alloy stainless steels that I've discussed, 304L, 316L, and lean duplexes can be welded without filler metal. Higher alloys, like 2205, should almost always be welded with a filler metal. Otherwise, you might have corrosion problems. When you weld stainless steel to carbon steel, um, it is critical to remove any coatings from the carbon steel near the weld, just as you would when welding carbon steel. Um, that galvanic coating, which is also detrimental to carbon steel welds, is also detrimental to stainless steel. Um, and zinc can cause embrittlement of either one. Um, painting of the joints is critical to prevent galvanic corrosion. Post-weld heat treatments might be needed for higher alloyed stainless steels. Uh, that will, especially uh, if you are trying to uh, use laser welding. Um, relative to carbon steel, stainless steel joints tend to have wider angles, smaller root gap base. Um, you do allow a, a root gap. Um, and you use more tack welding. D1.6 is very comprehensive in terms of covering all aspects of pre-qualification and qualification of welders. Um, you should always make sure that current welder certifications for the specific alloy and proposed method of welding are submitted as part of the bid package so that nobody is learning on your project. Um, The ductility and strength of the weld material is going to be a little less ductile than the parent material, um, especially if you do not heat treat. So that is something you should consider. And, and testing of that, that weld is uh, generally done. Um, for hardenable grades, like the precipitation uh, hardened stainless steels we've discussed, for fasteners and tension bars, um, strength could be affected by welding, and a specialist is needed. Um, always require a low carbon version of 304 or 316 or any of the austenitics when you are welding. Um, otherwise, you could have a corrosion issue. Um, duplexes. Um, have a higher risk of corrosion problems in welds if they're not properly welded. 1.6 covers inspection. Um, 
the requirements may vary with a specific structure, and it provides provision for that. It also discusses personnel qualification. Um, it's important to always use AWS certified weld inspectors. And there is a directory on the AWS site where you can determine um, whether or not their certifications are current. Um, it also discusses contractor applications, the types of destructive testing that can be used, and uh, provides some interpretation of problems and rejection criteria. Uh, a great deal of design assistance is provided by D1.6 with many examples of design, of design details. So I do encourage you to obtain a copy as a reference. It's important to remove heat tint or any contamination that is on the surface. Uh, so when you weld, you see you get heat tint on the surface. Uh, you have lost some level of corrosion resistance immediately at the surface, so it's important to use a pickling paste uh, or abrasion to remove that heat tint plus a little bit more stainless steel so you are down to the right chemical composition. ASTM A380 provides guidance on what methods are accept acceptable for restoring corrosion resistance. After fabrication, uh, or after the weld corrosion resistance has been restored, then you should consider using A967. That purely covers chemical passivation, um, including um, removing light surface contamination by free iron, oil, and, and uh, other means. Um, ASTM 967 will not restore the corrosion resistance of a weld. This is an example of stairs uh, at a swim club right on the harbor in Sydney, Australia. Um, they look great, other than some of the welds weren't cleaned up properly. It is important to clean before welding for any metal that you might be welding, but I do want to point out that stainless steels are more susceptible than two contaminants than carbon steel, so it becomes even more important to make sure that the shop practices are good. There's some basic fabrication considerations uh, that are discussed in more detail in the design guide, uh, but first, uh, and most important, always used experienced stainless steel structural fabricators. Someone that is used to welding light gauge may, may not have the experience to fabricate larger, heavier sections. There are many experienced industrial fabricators uh, who can do that. Um, duplexes are not the same as austenitics or precipitation hardened stainless steel. So make sure they have experience with a specific alloy of stainless steel that you are using. Require current certifications. Um, and, always, and if it is at all possible, use dedicated stainless steel fabrication areas, even if it's just one set part of the plant that has been set aside. You can use equipment that has been used on carbon steel but everything must be thoroughly cleaned, and the whole, including the, the surrounding work area. Otherwise, you can get carbon steel contamination. Uh, never allow anything containing carbon steel or anything that's been used on, on carbon steel to be used on stainless. Again, you could have contamination problems. So thank you for your time. OK. And thank you, Catherine. That was very good. We do have a couple of questions. And we have a little bit of time, a couple minutes, to go over some of them. So the first one I'm going to ask is, does stainless weigh the same as carbon steel? Uh, no, there are density differences. And, and, uh, and de density differences from one family of stainless steel to the other, uh, that is all included in the design guide. OK, thank you. And also on the um, <coughs> properties, 
how do ductility characteristics vary in the high strength stainless steel? Um, well, they, they are still relative to carbon steel uh, quite ductile, and um, all of the stainless steel the stainless steels we're talking about for large structural components all have at least 20 percent elongation, which is substantially higher than uh, what is required for a carbon steel. So uh, there are quite a few differences, and I believe Nancy is going to talk about how that impacts structural design in part two. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. If duplex has a similar coefficient of expansion to carbon, does it distort less than 304 and 316 grades when welding? Yes, it does. Okay. Yes, there, there's less movement of duplexes during welding than austenitics. Um, so um, that, that is an advantage. Okay, and also on um, welding, are there gluing or adhesive options? You can use all of the same construction adhesives that you would use with with other uh, ar other metals with stainless steel. But it is it's ideal to abrade the surface immediately before they are applied, because the passive film that makes stainless steel stainless uh, can also prevent good adhesion, both for adhesives but also for paint. Okay. Now, if welding plate to a structural shape, does the A240 plate material have the lower carbon content, like 316L or 304L? Um, A240, uh, the stainless steel specifications are quite different from carbon steel specifications. And an A240 um, provides uh, pages of, of different stainless steel chemistries. And, and covers the full range of stainlesses that are, are barely stainless to those that can be immersed in seawater. So um, the, the uh, standard name has no relationship to strength levels. Um, it, it's just a general standard that includes all the chemistries. Okay. Okay, now would you comment on the fatigue and the designs of stainless steels? I, I'm going to defer to Nancy, and, I, and, and okay. that might be a good precursor to, or an introduction to her presentation next week. Okay. Oh, That's something. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, yes, the fatigue resistance of stainless steels. Well, tests have shown that it's at least as good as that of carbon steel. In fact, the fatigue uh, resistance is more dependent on the geometry of the detail than the actual type of steel. So the guidance we put in the design guide is that um, what you do for carbon steel would apply for stainless steel when it comes to fatigue. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Now, with the poorly defined yield point, what is the typical elastic limit for stainless steel? Does it vary between type? Um, yes, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, the austenitic grades are a little more non-linear than the duplex grades. So what I mean by that is that um, the duplexes uh, are a little more similar to carbon steel. Um, the elastic limit, well, it does depend a little on, on the type of product we're talking about uh, and the process route. But you could estimate it could be between 40 and 70% of the 0.2% offset yield strength, which is the, the conventional way of defining a yield strength for materials like stainless steel that have non-linear stress-strain curves. Okay. And I think we have time for one more, and I'm going to go back in the presentation to slide 60. And 
someone is asking if you could explain that again, that the material that needs to have the most area for the least con corrosion, this area consideration? Sure. And, and actually, I'm going to go back one more slide. Okay. Um, to start that. So um, it, most of these were combining a we're combining steel with stainless steel. So the stainless the uh, stainless steel is much more cathodic, and there's a substantial difference uh, distance between them in the series. And if we had the actual numbers, you uh, you would see that it's quite substantial. Uh, so that's one of the factors. But that ties in with surface area ratio. A very small surface area of that more cathodic material, in this case a stainless steel fastener, will not have any significant impact on the corrosion rate of the carbon steel tread plate. Um, it's just too small an area for it to, to have um, that type of chemical reaction. Um, that doesn't mean that you might not have crevice corrosion underneath the fastener head, but the stainless steel will not increase that rate. In this case, we have a large surface area of stainless, very small surface area of the galvanized fastener. Um, so we already have a situation where this is going to corrode at a a uh, highly, you know, a highly, uh, a much faster rate in combination with the with the galvanized, um, and when you you then throw this ratio in, um, it it further accelerates the corrosion rate. Um, it, you know, hopefully that that explains it. But it, it's uh, the relative surface area ratio, not not the mass. Okay, thank you. Well, 